This is Special Prosecutor Larry Clayman. I'm the only lawyer ever to obtain a court ruling that a president of the United States committed a crime. For truth. For competition. As a young lawyer, I helped break up AT&T. That's why you have all your cell phones today. For sovereignty. For the republic. I'm the guy who, at Judicial Watch, which I founded, uncovered the Chinagate scandal. Millions of dollars going to the Clinton campaign, corrupting our political system. For the privacy of citizens. And I'm the only guy to have enjoined the National Security Agency from mass surveillance on hundreds of millions of Americans. Tearing it up. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. Bringing it back. We're going to take this country apart and put it back together again in the way envisioned by our founding fathers. It's not just talk. We're not just regurgitating news stories. Larry Klayman, special prosecutor, is making the news. And now, here's Larry. Welcome to this edition of Special Prosecutor with Larry Klayman. We have a lot to talk about today. Much has happened in the last week, and you need to know about it. Later on during the show, we're going to have Dinesh D'Souza, talking about his new book and movie, Death of a Nation, Plantation Politics and the Making of the Democratic Party. And we also have Cliff Kincaid on, who is from americasurvival.inc, talking about the Kavanaugh nomination. But let's talk about more of the same this week. You know, the French have an expression, the more things change, the more they remain the same. I'm kind of a Francophile, although I'm an American. I studied in France. Uh, And frankly, I've always admired the French in a way because they are like Americans in in, in some respects. They have tremendous pride. They have tremendous nationalism. But to get past the point of the French, let's talk about the more things change, the more they remain the same, a French proverb. More documents this week, more documents coming out as a result of Freedom of Information Act requests, as a result of individuals that go on Hannity, on Fox News and elsewhere, talking about the new information of corruption at the FBI and the Department of Justice. You know, this is not something that's new. It's been going on for a long time, but it's gotten much worse in recent years. And we see this tremendous corruption. And I say, more documents, no justice. You know, my former group, which I founded in 1994, Judicial Watch, it's not run by a lawyer. It's run by Tom Fitton and their investigator, Chris Farrell. He's not a lawyer either. So what they do is mostly Freedom of Information Act cases. And it's good to get documents out, but they don't go beyond that because they really don't have an experienced trial lawyer on staff. And they want to do the easy stuff, the easy stuff. And when you get documents, the networks want to have you on. So Fitton goes on Fox News and, you know, he boasts about the documents they got. But there's no justice. And that's the problem, no justice. And that's what we at Freedom Watch are trying to bring about with hard-hitting cases, with our going forward with citizens' grand juries in Dallas, Texas on September 25th. We've talked about that. We, the people, have the right to indict, to try, to convict, to sentence, and even do citizens' arrests peacefully and legally. Of course, we'll ask once we get the convictions of Hillary Clinton, Robert Mueller, James Comey, the intelligence chiefs under Obama, John Brennan, James Clapper, and Obama himself, because he's behind all of this, we'll ask the president to enforce those sentences stemming from convictions. And well, if he doesn't, then we'll seek to arrest these people ourselves peacefully and legally, because we have the right. Justice Scalia said that in 1992, the grand jury belongs to the American people, not to the three branches of government. This is the way it used to be before we had a Justice Department, which Congress created on July 1st, 17, uh, 1870. So what choice do we have? I mean, when you play cards, I've said this many times, with documents, you got to be able to put money on the table to win. So the money that we're going to put on the table is the power of the American people to enforce the justice system themselves. And we see a miscarriage of justice this week with regard to the Manafort trial in the Eastern District of Virginia. Regardless of whether Paul Manafort has committed tax evasion or not, the prosecutors that came into court immediately started to smear him showing that he had bought expensive suits, that he had a a leather jacket from an ostrich worth $15,000. And the judge, T.S. Ellis, who's a Reagan appointee, who should have had the courage to throw the whole case out, excuse me, I'm getting choked up again, at least admonished these prosecutors in front of the jury. You know, judges have a tremendous ability to influence the, the jury. They shouldn't do that technically, but they do do it. And I've seen it done by leftist judges. 
uh, like Colleen Kohler Catelli in Washington, D.C., and others, where they try to pervert the findings of the jury. Well, T.S. Ellis was signaling the jury, I think, in a borderline way, but he was doing it to try to help Manafort because he sees the injustice, and he told the prosecutors and criticized them and by saying, well, there's nothing wrong in being rich in the United States. In effect, we're not a communist country. But the real injustice of this thing is that the prosecutors of Robert Mueller, which in fact are being furthered by prosecutors in the Department of Justice, which are inert and cowardly attorney general overseas, so he's part of this, even though he says he's not, they're seeking 300 years from Manafort for tax evasion. And it tells you what's going on because they're trying to squeeze Manafort. They're trying to get him to come up with false testimony against the president because he was the president's campaign manager in 2016. This is the kind of thing that is out of control in this country. There's a tyranny. And our Justice Department has become the Department of Injustice. Mueller is part of the Justice Department. Jeff Sessions sits on top of that Justice Department with his corrupt deputy attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, who's simply a holdover Obama political hack, deep state hack. And this witch hunt against President Trump marches on. Now, the president this week, you know, criticized, well, more than criticized, I mean, he ripped uh, the Attorney General Jeff Sessions, suggested that he should resign. He's not doing his job. Of course, the president was then accused of obstructing justice, which was predictable. But the president said the truth, and he's entitled to say the truth like everybody else. And Sessions should do the right thing. If he was a true patriot, he would resign as attorney general and allow someone in that position to be nominated, at least put in in a temporary position, because the Democrats would never confirm anytime soon or allow the confirmation anytime soon of the attorney general, although I believe that a majority vote would do it at this point. But he needs to step aside because Rosenstein is just rubber stamping everything that Mueller wants. And this is now spilled over to my client, Clive and Bundy and his family. After Judge Gloria Navarro, who was no friend of the Bundys, in fact, she was a recommended appointee of Harry Reid, Dirty Harry, that corrupt senator in Nevada, now retired, but he's still behind the scenes as the Wizard of Oz, like Obama is, orchestrating the Democratic Party. After she dismissed the supersedious indictment against Clive and his sons and other defendants, the government came back and tried to have it reconsidered by Navarro. Navarro said no. But 30 days later, the Sessions Justice Department, if you can believe this, ladies and gentlemen, fellow patriots, filed a notice of appeal. And this is after Sessions begrudgingly started, which I have been lobbying him to do, a review of this political Bundy prosecution. We're going to talk about that later in the show with Dinesh D'Souza, because he was persecuted by the Obama Justice Department, too. He was charged with a felony for a simple campaign finance violation, which didn't amount to much. And he did time for that. And the President Trump ultimately pardoned him. Thank God. But the Bundys now, the government won't give up. Sessions sitting on top of a tyrannical and vicious and illegal act by the Obama Justice Department is furthering that. And it tells you just how corrupt this Justice Department has become. And I'm very, very saddened. You know, I saw politics when I was a prosecutor for the Department of Justice back during the Carter administration and the Reagan administration, I was a, 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 I wasn't a political appointee. I was a government functionary at the time. But, and, and I left. And ultimately, I started Judicial Watch. And now, of course, I run Freedom Watch, which does what Judicial Watch used to do, hard-hitting cases, citizens' grand juries, and things like that. I created my own Justice Department. Judicial Watch is no longer a private justice department. Freedom Watch is the private justice department for the American people. And that's why I'll be representing Cliven in this appeal. And we have other things up our sleeve and plan. And we need to fight back. And we need your support, you, the American people. And I hope that you will support Cliven's legal defense here. Go to clivenbundydefensefund.org. Contribute to that cause. We need your help. This is going to be expensive. clivenbundydefensefund.org. And also go to Freedom Watch in our cases there because Freedom Watch has Freedom of Information Act lawsuits on behalf of Clive and Bundy because we haven't gotten all the documents. You know, we found out during that trial that exculpatory evidence that would have resulted in a acquittal of the Bundys was withheld by 
Sessions prosecutors who were Obama holdovers, Stephen Myre, uh, Dan Sheets, and a lawyer by the name of, of Ahmed in that office. And this was an outrage. And even this very biased judge, Navarro, who was trying, doing everything she could to have the Bundys convicted, had to dismiss the supersedious indictment. What is a supersedious indictment? It's an indictment that follows the original indictment, which is then modified. So this is what we're up against with this Department of Injustice. And it's why you need a Freedom Watch, which has become your Department of Justice. So I urge you to go to freedomwatchusa.org, freedomwatchusa.org, support our citizens' grand juries. They're very, very expensive. The first one's going to be in Dallas, Texas, on September 25th, 2018, just about a month and a half away. And we need to ramp up. We need more lawyers. We need more investigators. We need to coordinate. We need to get facilities for these grand juries because we need to bring about justice ourselves. And that's why we need your help. And Cliven needs your support with regard to his defense because, believe it or not, Jeff Sessions, this disgrace of an attorney general who should resign, or be fired. The president should fire him at this point, as well as Rosenstein, and to take his lumps. He is furthering the persecution of Cliven Bundy, the person who stood up to a tyrannical government who did exactly what our founding fathers did in 1776 when King George III was busting into their homes, beating up their families, sometimes raping their women, stealing their property. This is what the federal government attempted to do with the Bundy Ranch, put them out of business, take their cattle, if they didn't take their cattle, they killed them. In fact, they did and buried them in mass graves. So go to clivenbunnydefensefund.org, contribute to that legal defense fund as well. We need your support. We need the American people's support. You need to rise up. See the column I wrote this week on this Brundy persecution at WND.com and on our website at freedomwatchusa.org. We're going to be right back with Cliff Kincaid uh, talking about the Kavanaugh nomination, which I generally agree with the president, but this one should be withdrawn. I'll be right back. Fearless. He's claiming he's crazy, he's racist, he's out to kill the Democrats. Dangerous. He's not here, he uses the court and the law. Lethal. This is bad. Special prosecutor. Very bad. Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. I want to introduce you now to Cliff Kincaid. He's president of American Survival, Inc. You can go to his website at usasurvival.org, usasurvival.org. He's a very good friend. Uh, He's somebody who has been a real warrior of the conservative cause. He doesn't flinch. He does what he thinks is right. I associate uh, Cliff with the way I do things. Uh, He's not there to please. He's not there to curry to the club in Washington, D.C., I might say, even the insider conservative club. And I brought him on to talk about Judge Kavanaugh, Brett Kavanaugh, who I feel is unqualified and should not have been chosen by President Trump. I hope that President Trump will withdraw his nomination nomination and, and nominate someone who truly is a conservative who believes in Fourth Amendment rights. I'll get into that, but I want to get to Cliff right now. Cliff, what's the big beef you have with Judge Kavanaugh becoming a Supreme Court justice? Well, the big beef, Larry, is, of course, that Kavanaugh is a member of the swamp. Uh, We're coming out with a new report. We call it The Deep State Wears Black Robes. And this really signifies Kavanaugh. This is a guy who's been a Washington insider for decades. He worked for President Bush, covered up for the Clintons, ruled in favor of Barack Hussein Obama on matters involving Obamacare and, as you know, the illegal surveillance powers of the NSA. And I think, I fear that as a Supreme Court justice, he will probably come under pressure to authorize or even expand the Russiagate investigation of President Trump. Well, he is a swamp creature. You're absolutely right. He bought $50,000 of tickets to the Washington (laughs) Nationals game, the baseball team in Washington, charged them on his charge card. Now, why would a judge who doesn't make that much money, particularly given the cost of living in Washington, D.C., extend $50,000 to buy tickets to take all of his friends to the Nationals game. He was obviously trying to curry favor with the Washington establishment, the Republican establishment, taking them to those games, hoping 
that there would someday be a Republican president that would nominate him for the Supreme Court. I've had him in a number of cases. I have experienced him with regard to our lawsuits at Freedom Watch. You can see them at freedomwatchusa.org, those lawsuits which we were successful initially in getting preliminary injunctions against Obama's intelligence agencies for illegal mass surveillance. That gave rise to the USA Freedom Act, which, of course, the intelligence agencies continue to violate, as we know, wiretapping Trump Tower and everything else. But the appellate court fu- ruled at one point that the preliminary injunctions I got were moot because of the new law. Well, Kavanaugh took it upon himself gratuitously to write an opinion saying the mass surveillance is fine. I can't support this guy if he doesn't believe in the privacy rights of American citizens who have not committed or been in the act of committing a crime or engaging in terrorism. Cliff, and, and coupled with the cover-up of Kavanaugh, of the Vince Foster investigation when he was working in the Independence Counsel's office for Ken Starr, I think this guy is a disaster. The Vincent Foster case is really the ultimate Clinton cover-up, in my view. As you know, Larry, I used to work for Reed Irvine, chairman and founder of Accuracy and Media. Together, we worked on the Vince Foster cover-up. He was the Clinton deputy White House counsel whose body, dead body was found in Fort Marcy Park outside of Washington, D.C. It was the the uh, highest ranking federal official to die under mysterious circumstances since JFK. And we have the evidence. We we have tape recorded conversations. We have documents from the National Archives showing that Kavanaugh, when he was a prosecutor in Ken Starr's office, covered up the evidence of murder. Whether it was murder or not, even if it was suicide, no one's ever explained the reason, he, you know, he would have killed himself. So it was a complete cover up. And then Star was- I would I would only add, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I would only add uh, there's so many anomalies in this case. For, first of all, uh, the gun was planted in his hand, it ha- even though it had none of his fingerprints on the gun, supposedly, that killed him. Uh, then they, we know that his body was in the park, but his car wasn't even there. Uh, we have an, uh, a witness, Patrick Knowlton, who, who testified to that. And when he stuck to his truthful story about the fact that Foster could not have driven himself to the park, he was then harassed and intimidated on the streets of Washington, D.C. by government agents sent out to harass him by none other than Brett Kavanaugh, as well as right. another another prosecutor in the case, uh, 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 Bates. Who, who, along with Kavanaugh, went on to become federal judges. There are a lot of unanswered questions, Cliff, and I'm going to have you back to talk about it. We're out of time in this particular segment, but you've raised extremely important issues. I thank you for your work. I urge urge people to go to usasurvival.org and donate to Cliff's organization. It's a great organization. God bless you, Cliff. Thank you. Now, four words that make corrupt politicians make wee-wee in their little pants. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this president. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Special Prosecutor Larry Klayman. Be the one who makes our country great again. Go to FreedomWatchUSA.org and donate. I'm back with the great filmmaker, activist, an intellectual, Dinesh D'Souza, and he has a new book called Death of a Nation, Plantation Politics and the Making of the Democratic Party, along with a film which has just come out. I urge everybody to go see that film. I'm going to be going to see it this weekend. And I want to introduce you to Dinesh D'Souza. But actually, before I do that, go to his website as well, deathofanationmovie.com. Deathofanationmovie.com. It's an extremely important book and film. And Dinesh, I want to introduce you to our listeners at Special Prosecutor. Thank you very much, Larry. It's great to be on the show. Well, it's a great honor to have you. Tell us a little bit about your background, not that everybody doesn't know, and also what this book and what this film is all about. I'm uh, an immigrant from Bombay, India. I came to the United States at the age of 17 as an exchange student. Um, I went to Dartmouth, undergraduate, uh, went on to a job at the Reagan White House um, as a policy analyst. I've spent most of my career in think tanks like the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and I've written now, I think, 
by last count, 16 books, of which the new one, Death of a Nation, is the latest uh, book. I started making films um, in 2012. I made a film about Obama and uh, the new uh, movie, Death of a Nation, my fourth uh, documentary film. Very excited. It's in the thousand theaters right now. And, um, and it couldn't be more timely. It deals with all the issues swirling in American politics. I really focused on two, um, fascism and racism. Uh, why? Because these are the two incendiary bombs that have been dropped not only on Trump, uh, but also on Republicans and conservatives, uh, on Christians, on patriots. Uh, the idea here is that fascism is somehow on the right uh, and that while racism may have once been in the Democratic Party, it is now the staple, the defining feature of the Republican Party. So the film examines these two progressive claims, um, and it does so by not only looking at history, uh, but bringing that history right to the present. We at Freedom Watch, I was the founder of Judicial Watch, and now I founded Freedom Watch and run that. We have a variety of lawsuits against Black Lives Matter, against Louis Farrakhan of the Nation of Islam uh, in Dallas, Texas. You might remember that massacre down there that occurred with the yep. police. I represent a policeman uh, who was assaulted named Demetric Penny and also a father of a fallen police officer, Enrique Zamoripa. And we, after we brought those lawsuits and after Obama left office, I, I don't know if you've noticed it, but there's much less racial division in this country other than the attacks on Trump. You don't hear Black Lives Matter going out there chanting, fry them like bacon, pigs in, in blankets or whatever it was. And Farrakhan's been relatively quiet. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on the effect that Obama had on race relations in this country? I think that Obama represented something uh, that was genuinely uh, a turn in the Democratic Party. Uh, and I saw this in, in my own case, uh, dealing directly with the Obama Justice Department uh, and with, um, uh, with Obama's effort to put me into federal prison uh, for exceeding the campaign finance law. Uh, now, in all honesty, I did exceed the campaign finance law. I did it with, you may say, good intentions. I was trying to help a college friend of mine who was running for the Senate. Um, normally, those kind of cases um, get a community service uh, slap on the wrist. But in my case, they went all out to um, uh, prosecute me on a felony charge. Now, the point I'm trying to make is this. Uh, I don't think that Jimmy Carter would have done that uh, any more than George W. Bush would try on some technicality to lock up Michael Moore. This is the leftist filmmaker, Michael Moore. Uh, I think there's been a gangsterization of American politics that started with Obama. And it's continued in the effort to, to get Trump, uh, in which the weapons of the state uh, are mobilized against political opponents. Uh, and Obama, as you said, also fomented, uh, licensed a certain kind of gangsterism on the street uh, that um, uh, took its cues from the way in which he spoke and the way in which he acted. Now, this is not obvious to a lot of people because on the surface, Obama seemed very serene, uh, but he was an agitator, uh, uh, and I think he got that. Uh, he was an Alinskyite, uh, Saul so Alinsky, of course, recommending these kinds of gangster tactics. Uh, Alinsky, in fact, uh, in a very revealing interview, confessed that he had learned a lot of this from the mafia. And so this is a scary thing that's come into American politics. People sometimes blame Trump, uh, but I think Trump is actually the product of it. Uh, it's an effort by Republicans to stop it. And we'll see if that happens. I think you're right. I, I think that uh, President Trump is a reaction to years of George W. Bush. I'm a Republican, too, personally, not as a, in terms of my activities at Freedom Watch. I'm nonpartisan. But Bush, in my view, did not do a good job as president. And then, of course, we got Obama, and that gave rise to Trump. So at least it gave rise to something good. And I remember watching your movie, Obama's America, a very excellent movie, accurate. But it is interesting that since Obama has left office, we've seen less, I would say, agitation by Black Lives Matter. Uh, we haven't heard Louis Farrakhan spout off recently. Of course, he's under a lawsuit in Dallas, Texas, which we brought. But it does seem that things have changed. However, you've got Obama in his $8 million mansion in Calorama in Washington, D.C., kind of like the Wizard of Oz, you know, behind the scenes, orchestrating a lot of foment, a lot of resistance uh, supported by George Soros. So he hasn't gone away, has he, Dinesh? 
Uh, absolutely not. And I think the, the Democrats now have turned their, their lens, if you will, uh, onto Trump. And they seem to be making an astonishing claim, a claim that to understand, you almost have to go back to Abraham Lincoln. This, by the way, is why I morph uh, Trump and Lincoln on my movie poster. Uh, people go, how can you compare those two men? And I'm not comparing them as people. They were very different. Lincoln, of course, was brooding, uh, melancholy, philosophical. Uh, Trump's temperamentally totally different. But um, in Lincoln's time, you had an outsider, Lincoln, uh, uh, who won as a Republican in a very narrow race, and all hell broke loose. Uh, And the other party, the Democratic Party, basically tried to cancel the election. The Northern Democrats were openly calling for Lincoln's assassination, which actually happened later. The Southern Democrats showed they were willing to break up the country rather than endure a Lincoln presidency. The same kind of craziness is going on now, except now the Democrats, the same party, by the way, which can't accept Trump's election, is basically saying the reason that Trump is illegitimate is he is like Hitler in 1933. He's a fascist. Uh, And the people around him, the the Republicans, the conservatives, are the party of fascism. And so uh, this is the big theme that I tackle uh, both in the book and the movie. The book is is, is where I put all the references. I lay out the argument. I support it. The movie, of course, is a dramatization, a kind of visual narrative that takes you through uh, what fascism and racism really are and which party um, uh, actually promoted them. So it's uh, it's a movie that helps you to sort of get there. Um, And at the end of the day, I think um, I try to show that the racist and fascist tale uh, do not belong on the right. Uh, but need to be pinned on the left uh, and have always been on the left. There's so much hypocrisy out there. You may know that I represent Cliven Bundy and members of his family, uh, that famous standoff that was successful in Las Vegas, Nevada, actually outside in Bunkerville. He went through a trial for two years, kept in incarceration. He was prosecuted, much like you, by the Obama Justice Department. And what's interesting and, and really sad and frightening is that after that successful raid, I wouldn't say it was a successful raid, but successful that Clive and Bundy and his peaceful protesters staved off uh, having to seize his land, kill more of his cattle. His sister was tased, assaulted. After that happened, Cliven gave an interview to the New York Times, uh, and he probably should have been more careful about it, but they asked him how he felt, and he said, I feel like the Negro in the Old South. Uh, I feel like my family's been persecuted just like them. Two weeks later, of course, he was called a racist by everybody uh, at that time on the left. Two weeks later, Obama's at the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and he's looking down from the dais at a a table which had Senator Rand Paul there. Rand Paul had been supporting Cliven Bundy and his stand against the government, seizing his land and his cattle. He's a rancher in Nevada. And, And... Obama says, looking down at Rand Paul, I see, Senator Paul, that that Nevada rancher's not with you. I understand you had invited him to this White House Correspondents' Dinner. He says, let this serve as a warning for anyone who starts a sentence off, let me tell you about the Negro. And Cliven didn't know that Negro was the wrong word. (laughs) He looked in the dictionary. He saw Martin Luther King used it. But two years later, he winds up getting indicted by the Obama Justice Department. I think It was retaliation, in large part, for him use of the word Negro. And this is the hypocrisy on the left. I mean, use a word like that and you become a racist, but yet the left are the racists, in essence. Very, uh, very revealing. Uh, In those days, uh, I was uh, friends with uh, Megyn Kelly. This is the the old Megyn Kelly of Fox News. And she had asked me to actually go to the uh, um, Bundy Ranch uh, and do a kind of news report. Uh, for her show about uh, the people who had come out to support Clive and Bundy. So I'm actually, I have some personal familiarity with that situation, uh, at least at the, at the origin of it. And, um, and yes, I think you're uh, quite right that um, Obama tried to intensify uh, the chill wind of political correctness. Now, you know, interestingly, the Nazis in the early years, they had a phrase called Gleichschaltung, uh, which basically meant bringing all the cultural institutions of society into line with Nazi ideology. Everybody needed to, in their words, quote, work toward the Fuhrer. 
Um, now, I'm not equating uh, the current atmosphere with Nazism, but I am saying that political correctness is the closest thing that we have today to that Gleichschaltung, an effort to sort of um, put a chill wind into America so that if someone says the, right, the wrong thing at work, they get fired. If someone uh, falls uh, toward the Hollywood bosses ideologically, they make sure you'll never work in that town again. Um, if you're a conservative professor in a university, the dean will make sure that you, you, know, you, you don't get tenure. I mean, this is actually um, a terrible thing that's happening in America, I think, uh, particularly a nation that has a First Amendment. Uh, and so a lot of my career is devoted to absolutely uh, trying to blow up this kind of nonsense. I think we should be able to speak our minds, speak more freely. Uh, I loved it, quite frankly, when Trump today uh, on social media basically uh, called Don Lemon the dumbest man on television. Uh, and he basically said that, he, that, that um, Trump made LeBron, that Don Lemon made LeBron James look smart, which is pretty hard to do. Now, on the face of it, here's the president making fun of two black men. But the beauty of it is that Trump doesn't have a racist bone in his body. Uh, he literally, he, uh, but he's also uninhibited. See, if I were doing that tweet, I would have to think twice. Wait a minute, LeBron James is black. Wait a minute, Don Lemon's black. We shouldn't think that way. True color blindness means that it should not matter that these guys are black or not black. Uh, and if you if Trump should allow should, should be Trumpian, whether he's dealing with LeBron James or Wolf Blitzer. You're absolutely right. And in that same tweet, he complimented Michael Jordan. In fact, he had been friendly with LeBron. LeBron turned on him. And I would have to agree, Dinesh, is that you can't worry about everything you say. It's what you do that counts. And this president, I believe he's going to be greater president than Ronald Reagan by the end. And I love Reagan. He's saying it as it is. And I know as a lawyer, as a former federal prosecutor that's toiled, you know, in the legal system now for 41 years, that our system has become very corrupt, that these judges are politicized. A lot of them are political hacks. One of them is has the Manafort case in Washington, D.C. Amy Berman Jackson is a good example of that. And this president calls it like he sees it. He's the first president to do that, and he knows the persecution against himself. So I want to well, thank you think- for exposing what's going on. We only have about 20 seconds left, and we'll have you back on a later show. But you know, sum it up, Dinesh, in terms of, of what you've accomplished here, because you've accomplished a great deal. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Reagan was a president in an era of gentlemen's politics, and I wish we could get that back. But uh, our politics today, the waters are much more royal, and we need a president who can deal with that, and, and that's Trump. Uh, this movie is about Trump, uh, but it's also about the great issues of race and fascism that are hurled at Trump. Um, and uh, please go see it, and go see it now, because if you yeah. see it now, you put fuel in that rocket. So uh, it helps the movie expand to more theaters. So deathofanationmovie.com is the website. Thank you for coming on, Dinesh. Uh, We'll have you on again, and, and God bless and good luck with this film. Thank you very much. Before he was a trial lawyer... He sliced him and diced him. People used to ask me, Larry, what caused you to start Judicial Watch and now Freedom Watch, given the powerful forces in this country that put you at risk? In a meat packing plant. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. A very special prosecutor, Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. This is the verdict segment of Special Prosecutor with Larry Klayman. And there's a very strong verdict today, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow patriots, is that we need to rise up. We, the people, need to not just take this country back. We need to put it back together again because it has been blown up by the left. It's been blown up by Obama and his supporters like George Soros, who are financing a lot of these evil deeds. And, of course, we listened to Dinesh D'Souza, and she ta- he talked a lot about how free speech is being chilled, how this country is no longer able to express itself in terms of its views, in terms of the vision of the founding fathers, and how the left uses these tactics to try to silence us. And of course, Dinesh himself, there was an attempt to silence him through the Obama Justice Department, obviously directed by Obama. He was indicted for a minor minor infraction of campaign finance law, and in fact did eight months' time, thank God the president, pardoned him, tried to shut Dinesh out, up. But it's not just 
the fact that they're out there bringing legal cases uh, such as this, a prosecution of Dinesh D'Souza. Now we see Clive and Bundy, who I believe was indicted because he used the word Negro. He was actually favoring Negroes and blacks. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the word or African-Americans. It's all the same thing. I'm a minority myself. I, I don't mind if people call me by different names as long as they don't do it in a hateful way. But what, he, what we didn't talk about with Dinesh, and I'm sure he agrees with me, it's not just the efforts to silence conservatives and libertarians and people at faith at universities and elsewhere. It's violence. And of course, Freedom Watch has lawsuits against Antifa and the city of Berkeley in Oakland, California. We need your support for that. Go to freedomwatchusa.org. We learned just this week that Antifa, this radical fascist group, ultra left, bunch of lunatics, they're very, very dangerous, is actually training its troops, so to speak, to harm police officers, to physically assault them and or kill them. And this is the kind of thing that Freedom Watch does. You see, we put our foot forward. We're not like Judicial Watch. We're not just getting documents. We are bringing hard-hitting cases. There's great risk here to me, to everybody that's associated with this case. But we have to do what we have to do. I was in court a few weeks ago, and two goons from Antifa walk in. I mean, they look like they landed from another planet. Uh, and they were there drawing pictures of me while I was making an argument in front of this judge to, to intimidate me, to say, hey, we know who you are, and we know where we can go to get you if we have to. And, of course, they probably intend to. They've beaten up people. Our client, Kiara Robles, who just came to hear a speech by my Milo, a Breitbart at the time, uh, a nice gay woman who is a conservative, and they beat her up at Berkeley. So this is what we're up against. And it's why you need to support Freedom Watch. Go to freedomwatchusa.org and contribute to our cause. Contribute to Clive and Bundy's defense fund, to cliveandbundydefensefund.org. And we're also out there with our citizens' grand juries. And that's something that we're ramping up because we need to choose citizens from neutral voter rolls in Dallas when we start that on September 25th of this year. We need then to hire a retired judge or someone who's independent once we get the indictments of Hillary and Bill Clinton, of James Comey, of Robert Mueller, of Comey. I just repeated that again. He, maybe he should be indicted twice. The guy's just unbelievable. And of course, the intelligence chiefs under Obama and Obama himself. We need your strong support for that. We need your strong financial support. We need your moral support. We need your prayers. And of course, we're very instrumental. We have a Judicial Selection Strike Force, and we've recommended that the president nominate someone other than Brett Kavanaugh. We don't need a Washington establishment hack as a Supreme Court justice. We need somebody with real courage, somebody who'll stand up for us against mass surveillance by the intelligence agencies and the FBI that hold us under a sort of Damocles, which, again, chills free speech because these people try to dig up dirt on anybody who's challenging the government, and they have, and they've done it with with President Trump, you know, they smear him, his family, and his colleagues. So I really urge you to support Freedom Watch. We are what Judicial Watch used to be. We are the People's Justice Department. And I'm a trial lawyer of 41 years experience. I'll do what it takes, and I don't worry about the consequence, because our founding fathers certainly didn't either. And if we're going to preserve this country, if we're going to save this country, if we're going to bring it back to their vision at Philadelphia on July 4th, 1776, we need to rise up and we need everybody's support. I'll be back next week with another show of Special Prosecutor with Larry Clayman. Until then, God bless you and your family and God save America.